Hello and welcome. I'm Whitney Espick and I'm the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association. I want to thank you for joining us to witness a total solar eclipse in this special program brought to you by the MIT Alumni Travel Program and the Alumni Association. While we'd all love to be on the ground in South America today to witness the eclipse in person, we do have the benefit of watching it via live feed and of being joined by three MIT experts. To guide us through this cosmic event and provide rich information about eclipses, we have MIT Professor of Planetary Sciences and veteran of seven eclipses, Richard Benzel, and Amanda Bosch, a senior lecturer and the observatory operations manager at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff. Amanda is also a double degreed MIT alumna and has witnessed two eclipses. Moderating our discussion today is Dr. Michael Person, who is an MIT research scientist and director of the MIT Wallace Observatory. Michael is an MIT alumnus four times over. If you have questions for our speakers, please be sure to type them in using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, as we will be having a Q&A session immediately following the presentation. I also want to note that this session is being recorded and will be posted soon on the MIT Alumni Travel Program website, along with other past virtual events. And now, I am delighted to hand the reins over to Professor Benzel, Dr. Bosch, and Dr. Person to take us up into the skies. I hope you enjoy. It wasn't until 1715 that Edmund Halley of Halley's Comet fame used Newton's laws to predict successfully the solar eclipse of that year, which went over Great Britain. Um, his prediction was actually only four minutes off, so he did a really great job. And in fact, he was using um, the work of um, Isaac Newton, which had come out um, just a little bit before that, to do to make these predictions and to figure out when this next solar eclipse was going to happen. Um, if we can move to slide seven, please. Um, it's not only humans that are affected by solar eclipses, it's also animals. Uh, during the time of a solar eclipse, um, as we're getting closer and closer to totality, the light gets um, darker, you know, um, it gets, the sun is, faint, is getting fainter, the light is getting darker, it gets a little bit colder. And during totality, um, you actually, people have witnessed that um, animals, you know, birds will suddenly stop chirping, it'll get quiet. Um, as in this picture, bees will return to their hives. Um, and, you know, all of the animals will start to, you know, tuck in for the night. And in this particular case, night only happen, lasts for two to seven minutes. And then they start to back about their days as well. And there have been reports of, of animals, you know, being, being concerned about how short the night was at this particular time. So, you know, everybody is affected by eclipses, by just really the splendor of them and, and the uncertainty of them as well. So I'm going to toss it back to you, Rick, and maybe you could talk a little bit about what ha what is happening. <laughs> All right. So I want to uh, de dive a little further on why do we see total solar eclipses. And uh, <laughs> the, the answer is surprisingly simple. Uh, and it's because the moon orbits the Earth. And, uh, and, and if it never occurred to you, the orbit of the moon is about one month. And that's why we have 12 moons or months in a year. And a total solar eclipse happens at the phase of new moon. And so every month, the Earth, moon, and sun are in alignment. And this is the, the moon phase we call uh, new moon. But as it turns out, you know, and, and as you know, total solar eclipses are really rare. And we don't have a total solar eclipse uh, every month. And so I'm going to pass it over to Mike to tell us why don't we have a total solar eclipse every month? Thank you, Rick. Um, yes, the first thing people ask when they see that little picture you were showing earlier is if the sun is, if the moon is going around the earth like that, why don't we get one every month? But it turns out the moon is not actually orbiting in the same plane that the earth is orbiting the sun. The earth orbits around the sun in a plane we call the ecliptic, and the moon is actually orbiting in a plane that is five degrees inclined to that. So most of the time, the moon is above or below the ecliptic plane. And I should admit here, as I was talking to Rick the other day, um, as a professional astronomer, it took me an embarrassingly long time to realize that the ecliptic plane is named after the eclipses that occurred in it. Um, but this line of nodes from where the, um, 
orbit of the moon actually intersects the ecliptic plane is the only place we can see eclipses. So as the earth is revolving around the sun, we have to wait until the nodes line up with the new moon. Most of the time it doesn't do that. As you can see here, the um, new moon is happening. It's casting a shadow, but the shadow misses the earth. It's about five degrees above the earth or below the earth for the full moon, the um, earth shadow misses the moon. So that's also why we don't get a lunar eclipse every month. Um, these effects conspire to um, give us an eclipse approximately once a year or so, depending upon where you are and how often you see them. Um, when they do line up though, if you wanna move on to slide 12. Coming. <laughs> when they do line up, the moon comes in and blocks out the photosphere, the really bright part of the sun and allows us to see the corona all around it. This is actually quite remarkable. Were the moon larger or smaller, we wouldn't actually get to see it quite so well. Um, Amanda, do you wanna talk a little bit about why the moon and the sun appear to be the same size? Yeah, thank you, Mike. This is actually, um, it's, a, it's an accident of size and distance. And so if we can go to slide 13, um, what we have here is we have of our moon at you know with its with its size and it's at a distance from us and then the sun is is much larger than the moon but it's also further away and so for each of these bodies what we do is we calculate the angular size and this is the apparent angular size of of each of the bodies and so that is just um it's we just use our um our basic trigonometry here and use um the arctangent of the diameter divided by the distance and what we can see is that for the moon, the, di the apparent angular size is roughly half a degree. And for the sun, the angular size is roughly half a degree. And so basically these two line up to be exactly the same um, angular size in the sky. This is an interesting, um, it's an interesting you know, arrangement. And um, if we can then move to slide 14, what this means is that if these two bodies are exactly the same size or very close to it, then we can see eclipses and eclipses where the moon only just covers the sun. Um, if, it, if the moon were a much larger in an angular sense, then it, we would see what we have on the right hand side of this, of this slide here where the moon would be covering the sun, but it would also be covering that photos, the corona as well. So we wouldn't be able to see some of the things that we do, we are able to see during an eclipse. And if our moon, the apparent size of our moon were much smaller compared to the sun, then we would see a shadow of the moon transit across the sun, as we can see in this um, left image in this particular slide. It turns out that um, for us here on Earth, where um, I believe we're the only place in the solar system where we get this this um, this quite uh, this this alignment that's quite this exact. There are other places in the solar system where you can see. Um, moons transit the sun, for instance, on Mars. And then you can also see moons block the sun completely, but by a large amount on um, Jupiter and Saturn. All right, so there are some additional things that we can think about because um, the moon's size is not constant, but I'm gonna throw that back to you, Rick. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, just as we uh, come back and continue to talk about uh, why the size of the moon or the amazing fact that the size of the moon in our sky matches the size of the sun. I want to again call your attention to the, the Q&A window that you have available to you. We uh, hope you'll put uh, lots of questions uh, into the chat there and, um, and we'll uh, try to get to them as best we can during our broadcast. And again, we are uh, tapping into video feeds uh, provided by NASA and other organizations. And so bear with us as those feeds uh, uh, come along. <clears throat> okay, so there's it's this really fortuitous alignment where uh, we have new moon, and that is when the moon is on a line between the uh, Earth and the sun. And, um, and at the same time, the moon has to be in the same orbit plane of the Earth called the ecliptic plane. Um, but there's another factor that gets involved here, and that's because the moon's orbit is not circular. And if the moon is at a slightly changing distance from us, that means that the apparent size of the moon from the arctangent equation that Amanda showed uh, 
um, the uh, if the moon is slightly different uh, di uh, has slightly different distance from the Earth, its size is going to get smaller or larger depending if it's further or closer to the Earth. And so, at its closest point, the the uh, closest point in its orbit, what we call perigee, that's when the size of the moon, and that's where the equation that Amanda just showed you. Um, is uh, is very well matched to the size of the sun. And so right now the moon is at nearly its closest point in its orbit, about 356,000 kilometers. And that means that the moon is just right. The size of the moon in our sky is just right to block out the sun. But there are other times of the year when the uh, new moon comes at the time when the moon is at an apogee or at its furthest point in its orbit. So the apparent size of the moon, that arctangent of theta is a little smaller and the moon is just a little bit too small in its angular size to completely cover the disk of the sun. And this is where we get an annular eclipse. And an annular eclipse, the last one we had was uh, back in June of this year. An annular eclipse is very interesting to see, but it's not quite as spectacular during its total phase because you still have the bright disk of the sun around the edges of the moon. And that bright disk of the sun doesn't allow us to see the amazing structure of the outer corona, the outer layers of the sun. And so uh, this is what makes total solar eclipses so special and so rare is you have to get a confluence of events. You have to have the moon at perigee. You have to have uh, the new moon uh, occurring at the time that the moon it's, itself is in its orbit crossing the ecliptic plane or the orbit plane of the Earth. So uh, really a pretty amazing uh, set of geometries. Um, but the you know, eclipse geometry is sort of like the gift that keeps on giving. There's uh, many other factors to it as well. And you've probably seen this diagram many times. It's hard to see something about eclipses and not see a diagram like this. And uh, this is just a diagram that shows us that there's two kinds of shadows that happen during a solar eclipse. And the first is that dark inner circle there, which is where you have to be on the Earth's surface so that the sun is completely blocked. And that dark inner circle there is called the umbra, U-M-B-R-A, umbral shadow. And if you're somewhere on the Earth where the sun is only partially blocked, then you're in that partial shadow, which is called the penumbra. And I always remember penumbra, the P for partial in the partial penumbral shadow. So under the umbra, the sun is completely blocked and that's that dark inner circle that you see all the time in these eclipse diagrams. And the partial eclipse where, you, where an observer on the ground would see the moon and uh, some sliver of the sun. That's where you see the penumbral shadow. And uh, this is really one of the best illustrations I've ever seen, this uh, space, uh, space shuttle image of a total solar eclipse, where you can actually see the dark umbral shadow of the moon on the Earth's surface. And you can imagine this, uh, this shadow sweeping across the Earth's surface. And it actually, the, the, the speed of the shadow is, is supersonic. It usually travels across the Earth, Earth's surface at about Mach 2. So it's really an amazing, an amazing thing. And if you're not in the umbral shadow, so again, you see the penumbra, you see the, uh, the, the uh, partial eclipse of the sun. All right. So, um, I hope that it helps explain why we have these narrow eclipse tracks, because that narrow eclipse track that you see on a map, and this may be familiar to you from the August 2017 uh, total solar eclipse that was visible ac across North America. Um, and many of you may have seen the total eclipse back in August of 2017. And many of you, and even more of you, of course, saw just the partial eclipse. And all I'm telling you is that the main event, the thing that is absolutely worth uh, doing is getting yourself into that umbral narrow eclipse path. Get into the path where the moon is completely blocked by the sun because it's a it, I like to say seeing a total solar eclipse is a million times better than seeing a partial eclipse. 
because the brightness levels, when that last bit of the sun is blocked, you've lost, uh, you change in brightness by a factor of a million. And it's this incredibly dynamic experience. So if you did not get yourself into the umbral shadow, into the shadow path back in August of 2017, your next chance in the continental United States is on April 8th, 2024. And you can see uh, the place or places to be uh, in April 2024. So mark your mark your calendars now. All right. So that is all a lead in to explain how we got to today and why we are um, in the in uh, looking at telescope feeds from Chile and Argentina, uh, because that is where this narrow umbral shadow path the shadow path of this total solar eclipse is choosing to cross the Earth's surface. And so the telescope feeds that you're, you're seeing are um, coming to us live. And I don't know if the current feed is in Chile or Argentina, but uh, this is why we are challenged to, um, uh, to uh, get a feed from a remote part of the world. And, um, and uh, with that, I think we're going to try to take a, a few minutes for, uh, for questions. And I just put on uh, a couple of uh, slides or a couple of images of the region of Chile, where uh, at least one, uh, one of our telescope feeds is coming from, uh, the, from the, the mountains uh, just in the southern part of Chile and uh, also in the uh, plains of, uh, of Patagonia plains of Argentina. All right. So with that, Mike, I'm going to turn it to you and see uh, what's coming in for questions. Thank you, Rick. Um, we have a number of questions happening in the chat. If when you ask your question, you'd like to um, provide your name, I'll be happy to call that out. We have one question from Juan Ribeiro who asks, what sort of tangible effects do we see here on the ground during a solar eclipse? Oh, um, I think Amanda, you're going to cover that in just a few minutes. We'll talk about uh, what it is, what it feels like to be on the ground. Okay. Do you okay. want me to say something now? We could just wait for that. Yeah. Away. Just give a quick uh, <laughs> give, okay. give give a quick thing, and then we'll we'll show you some detail. We have a couple of images to show you in detail. We'll bring up in just a minute. Yeah. So as 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 we approach totality on the ground you will start to see the, um, the, just the light, the quality of the light is, is different, it's changing, it gets darker. Um, we'll see something about shadows on the ground, which we'll show you some images about later. And um, like I had mentioned previously, you might start to see animals preparing for night. Um, and um, so yeah, it's, there's, a, there's a number of things that let you know that there is something important happening at the time. The, te the temperature of the air gets colder. Um, Yep, I think that those are the main things. Okay. Great, what, what else we got there, Mike? We have another question. Would you like to talk a little bit, Amanda, about some of the earlier scientific studies during an eclipse and what they might have yielded? Certainly, so um, I'm gonna talk about, I'm just gonna talk about, mention one thing, because I know, Mike, you've got some additional um, uh, information that you're going to share shortly. Um, in 1919, um, the, the, the total solar eclipse of 1919 in, on May 29th was used as a test of Einstein's theory of, um, of, of general relativity. And um, this, was, this, this test was performed by Eddington and um, the, Einstein had only recently published his theory of relativity in 1915. And it was realized that because general relativity really is dealing with the theory of gravitation and what happens when you have a very massive object in space, it actually will bend the path of, of starlight. And so during a total solar eclipse, what you can do is look at the positions of stars um, as you know, uh, around the limb of the sun, the stars that appear to be close to the sun and compare their positions to when the sun isn't there. And you'll actually see a little bit of deflection of starlight because the sun is there, but it's only about uh, less than two arc seconds. It's, very, it's actually quite small. And so this attempt in 1919 was successful and was, uh, I guess, the first proof of um, Einstein's theory of gravitation of general relativity. All right. 
Uh, as we get to the next question, I just want to point out we're T minus 40 minutes, almost exactly 40 minutes away from the total solar eclipse. Uh, at this point, you can see in the feed, the sun is about 40% covered. And the, uh, the shadow of the moon is now currently about 2,000 kilometers west. The umbral shadow of the moon is about 2,000 kilometers west of Santiago, Chile heading on a southeastern path across the South Pacific Ocean. Mike, what questions do we have? Um, we have a question from Skylar Larson, who asks, what sort of equipment do you need to observe or take photos of eclipses? Uh, I'll try that first. Um, so uh, during, uh, during the partial phases, you need eclipse glasses, and we'll show you those in just a minute, just so that uh, you can look at the sun with the protective eye. But the most important thing is you need, during all the partial phases, you need a filter over the front of your optics. Again, it's over the front of your optics because you want to filter out the light before it begins getting focused uh, through, your, uh, through your lenses. And similarly, if you're looking at the eclipse, you put your eclipse glasses over the front of your eyeglasses. Um, but during totality, you don't need any special filters and you can just look up and watch. And uh, there's a lot of specialized equipment. And uh, just after our Q&A break here, uh, Mike Person is going to tell us about some of these experiments. So thank you, Skylar, one of our MIT students. And the um, last question for this section, um, Red Garen asks, at any given place on Earth, how frequently will you see solar solar eclipses? <sighs> Boy, did, uh... Uh, I have an answer, but let's see if you guys have a, something better pulled out of memory cells. Um, uh, uh, in my experience, in my, in my uh, just uh, knowing eclipse maps, uh, I think you're lucky if you just stand in one place for your entire lifetime of uh, 90 years. Um, if you just stand in one place, I think you have maybe a 50-50 chance of, of a total solar eclipse finding you in your lifetime. So um, by and large, to see one, you probably do have to get up and move into a shadow path. Um, you could look up, I didn't, don't have a slide ready for this, but you could look up shadow paths of eclipses over the course of a century. You can see them crisscrossing the earth. Okay, do you, we have time for more questions right we'll now? We'll take one more question and then we'll, um, we'll move on and we'll talk a little bit about science. All right. Um, one question that's trending upward in the chat is, what is the likelihood of the moon being exactly the right size for these spectacular <laughs> eclipses? Or is that really just random chance? As best we can tell, it's random chance. Uh, people have pointed to this uh, this amazing coincidence as divine inspiration. Um, it uh, it's not uncommon. Uh, uh, well, as we understand the late stages of planetary formation, um, it is a little bit of a of a lucky happenstance happenstance that the moon, I'm sorry, that the earth has such a large moon. Uh, there's one other case in the solar system of a very large moon around its host planet. And that of course is Pluto, um, has a very large satellite, even half the size of, of Pluto itself. So there is one other place in the solar system of the ratio of the size of the moon to the size of the planet uh, is much larger. Um, but uh, it's a bit of a happenstance and it's even a happenstance in time because in in a billion years or so, uh, the moon's orbit is moving outward. Uh, it's stealing rotational angular momentum of, from the Earth and putting that into orbital angular momentum of the moon. That's from tides. And there will be a point in time where the moon never comes close enough to, to the Earth to uh, allow for total solar eclipses. And so, um, so it's even a, a lucky circumstance of time. Uh, anyway, Amanda or Mike, do you have a, a better answer than that? No, I think that that was a that was a great answer, Rick. Um, and um, yeah, once the moon is is slowly spiraling out from um, from the Earth, and so when it when it hits this this point of being um, totally tidally locked, that's what you're talking about. Then we won't get total. We'll get annular solar eclipses, but not not ones like we see now, but not in our lifetimes. Yep. Oops. All right, so. 
Um, I think now maybe we'll just go back and uh, try to uh, give you a little more uh, a little more meat to the program here. And uh, with this, I want to. I think it's a good place and a good time uh, to uh, talk about the the science of total solar eclipses. And uh, with that, I'm going to um, uh, pass it over to uh, to Mike and ask. Um, uh, if, as you mentioned earlier, Mike, you were planning to be uh, down in Argentina, I believe, to be making measurements of this uh, total solar eclipse. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about the experiment that uh, that was planned um, by you and other scientists? Yes, we had. Um, one of the big problems in um, astrophysics right now, or for the last, for quite a while actually, is called the coronal heating problem. Basically, we have this image here of the sun. You see down in the core, you have the nuclear fusion occurring, generating the energy that powers our sun. And in the core, the temperatures tend to be around 15 million degrees. And as that energy propagates outward of the sun, photons move through the radiative zone and the convective zone. The further you get away from the nuclear furnace, the cooler the sun gets. It drops to 7 million degrees, down to 2 million degrees at the end of the radiative zone. And up near the top of convection, where we have this photosphere, that's the disk of the sun that we actually see, the temperature is down to 5,000 Kelvin. Now, strangely, as you get higher than that and you go into the corona or the atmosphere of the sun, if you want to move to the next slide, Rick, the um, temperature suddenly starts to rise. After it comes out of the photosphere, goes through the chromosphere, there's a small rise. It's not difficult to explain. But suddenly, as you enter the corona, the temperature goes up by a couple of orders of magnitude going back to a million degrees. For a very long time, it was worried that this was some sort of violation of thermodynamics. You know, how is the cooler photosphere heating the corona up to a million degrees? But right now we have theories indicating that this is due to oscillations in the magnetic field of the sun exciting the corona. <laughs> So one of the things we were going to try to do during this solar eclipse is see if we could measure those oscillations. Um, on the next slide, we have the equipment that we constructed between ourselves at MIT and our colleagues at Williams College. Our coronal, coronal oscillation experiment um, consists of two co-mounted telescopes. We built a custom mounting plate so that the two telescopes could be focused on the same portion of the sun to within an arc second. And we have two identical cameras on each telescope. The difference between the two telescopes are these very narrow filters. So each telescope is looking at a slightly different color of the corona. Um, in fact, we're focusing on colors being emitted by the highly ionized iron that's present in the corona. These two colors, we're hoping to see, or we were hoping to see a um, oscillation between the excitement of each color on a scale of approximately one or two seconds. So these are high speed cameras to take images of the corona 50 times a second in two different colors, um, built the cameras and um, a final assembly was done here at MIT. Many of the components such as the custom mounting plate were built by our colleagues at Williams College. And the plan was to take all of these down to Argentina and observe the eclipse in order to um, get a handle on the coronal heating problem. Unfortunately, in the days of coronavirus, the logistics just got too far out of hand. We were unable to get our equipment down there, but we do have the equipment and we'll certainly be pulling it out at the next available solar eclipse. All right. I'll pass it back to you there. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mike. All right, we are almost exactly 30 minutes away 30 minutes and counting down to the time of total solar eclipse. And again, the exact timing depends on the exact telescope feed that we're able to tap into. And um, we, there are telescopes in various locations. And the telescopes you, the, themselves, as I can uh, tell from just watching um, what's going on in the world here at the same time. Uh, some telescopes are uh, under the clouds. And so uh, that's a pretty frustrating experience, um, but others are in, uh, in uh, places of good sky. And uh, right now our main feed is coming to you from uh, central Argentina, where we are on, on at this moment, this second, almost exactly 
30 minutes and zero seconds away from the start of totality. Um, so right now we, uh, we're seeing the, uh, the sun, the disk of the sun is getting close to 50% covered uh, right as we speak. Uh, and the uh, shadow of the moon, the umbral shadow of the moon, is now 800 kilometers west of Concepcion, Chile. And of course, the shadow as it's moving from west to east will first hit the coast of Chile. And in fact, it touches the coast of Chile uh, right around 11 o'clock this morning Eastern time is when the umbral shadow, that dark inner shadow, first touches the coast of Chile. And then it will speed across Chile and Argentina. And we'll get our turn depending on which telescope feed that uh, that's uh, coming to us. So I just want to remind you, uh, I'll just pause for a second and say, I just want to remind you that we're watching a sequence here and uh, the sequence uh, um, that is uh, on your screen here uh, is the full sequence from the first partial phases. And we're now sort of at the third notch here on in the upper left where we're about 50% covered by the sun and headed in 30 minutes from now to be having the sun totally covered by the disk, the disk of the moon. Um, there was a question in the chat about what do observers on the ground start to see? And, and right now, right around 50% is where if you didn't know an eclipse was happening, you would really start to sense that something strange was going on. The quality of the light gets really different. And that's because of the sun, instead of being sort of a disc, giving you a diffuse light on the ground, this, the, the size of the sun or the light from the sun starts narrowing and getting narrow, narrower and narrower sort of into a pencil beam and the quality of the light and the sharpness of the light and the sharpness of the of shadow starts to change dramatically and the color of the sky starts to change it starts to get a little bit cooler and as it cools off often you'll get a little bit of a wind uh developing and um in my experience you know right around now as you're starting to sense something that is something's different and you look around and maybe you know there's no clouds in the sky but it really feels different there's just you start to get this sense of it unease right around now, about 30 minutes before totality. Um, but there's other effects that one can see on the ground. And Amanda, do you wanna talk about those? Absolutely. So um, uh, if we have slide 28, um, what we see, um, if, you're, if you're on the ground, as Rick is saying, you know, if you didn't know that this was happening, you might start to get this feeling that something was happening. But the thing that would really tell you that you're at a special place in time, is if you looked at the ground, what you might start to see is um, something like this that, you're, that you can see on the right hand um, corner of this particular slide. It's called the pinhole effect. And what is happening is whenever you have a pinhole that acts as a projection camera. And so um, in, the, in the little cartoon in the upper left, you can make your own pinhole by just taking a, a thick card and putting a small hole in it and then projecting the, holding that up to the sun and then projecting the image of the sun onto another card or the ground. Um, now the, the picture that you see here in the lower right is actually uh, formed by overlapping leaves on a tree. And so as those leaves overlap, then you know there are little pinholes of light where the light can get through. And normally you would just see that as little speckles of light. But during a solar eclipse, each of those little spaces where the leaves are over overlapping and still letting the sunlight through, that acts as a pinhole camera. And so you can get a, just an amazing image like this where you can see just all of these projections of the sun on the ground. Now, you can do this yourself during an eclipse by using a very highly specialized piece of equipment. Um, here we go. Oh, nope, the background isn't gonna let me do this. <laughs> um, so I've got here a colander um, with a lot of little holes in it. And so if you go outside during an eclipse and you don't have, if you don't happen to have any of the special glasses that you need, just go outside with your colander and hold this up and then look on the ground beneath it and then you'll be able to see and you know the the images of the sun such as this so if we can go to the next slide please rick all right so there's something uh, that we always talk about during uh, total solar eclipses 
And what we always talk about during total solar eclipses is eye safety. And uh, that's why during total solar eclipses, uh, one always wants to have uh, a set of specialized eclipse glasses. And uh, it's really great because, um, you know, we can all look like our true inner geeks by wearing around our, our solar eclipse glasses. All right, so, um, so just for the comic of the three blind mice is uh, why we need them, um, you know, but why is it, you know, we always get these, um, these directives and these warnings about, oh my gosh, that's the solar eclipse, you're gonna damage your eyes. You know, what is it that, um, uh, you know, leads to all these particular warnings about eye damage from eclipses? Well, uh, it's two reasons. One, if there's an eclipse, everyone wants to go and look up at the sun. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that's always not the best thing to do. Um, but, you know, it turns out that the, um, the human eye has a normal aversion to staring at the sun. And you know this, if someone's trying to take a picture of you and you're staring into the sun when the, uh, and they say, take your sunglasses. Normally we have normal defenses that protect us from that. But here's the deal with uh, that is not blocked, still is emitting, still sending towards our eyes, those deadly or deadly or damaging ultraviolet rays. And so um, our natural aversion, our natural defense is compromised during a total solar eclipse. Um, and so it's a time when we want to look at the sun and the natural defenses that would otherwise protect our eyes, protect our retinas, literally from being sunburned, we don't wanna sunburn our retinas, um, is being compromised. And so this is why you see all this, uh, all the warnings about you needing eclipse glasses during a, a solar eclipse. You can go outside and go about your business all you like during a solar eclipse. It's just that uh, if you stand up and look at the sun, um, then, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and you're not protected. It's, you can do it. You can look at the sun and you, you can suffer damage. So it, it's, it's why these warnings, uh, why these warnings come about. Absolutely. All right. And Rick, I, I can yeah. just jump in for a second. Please. Um, I can, uh, I, you, through the, um, through the years when, you know, you've seen different solar eclipses, I've, you know, I've seen reports of, of people going to the doctor because they're having trouble seeing and, you know, being able to, the, the optometrist can actually look at the retina and see that there's actually damage on the, on the person's retina in the shape of an eclipsed, partially eclipsed sun. So this is your, you know, this is really serious. You don't want to, um, you don't want to hazard, you know, to, to, to potentially damage your eyesight. I also know that um, in terms of equipment, um, we, we sometimes do solar observing at MIT, as you know. And um, one of the things that you were saying is you, if you're using a telescope to be looking at, to look at this eclipse, you wanna make sure you put your, your, um, your eclipse, uh, your, um, the filter on the front, because otherwise the entire telescope could be heating up. And we've actually had cases where something, you know, we had a telescope maybe pointing at the sun accidentally and um, the lens cap at the back of the telescope instantly melts. We have a uh, we have a collection of melted lens caps from telescopes that pointed too quick to, at the sun for just a short period of time. So this is uh, very serious and we don't want to be um, running that risk with our with our eyeballs. Okay, with that, uh, let's go back to um, some questions. Mike, what questions have come in? We've got one question from a fifth grade classroom in Burlington, Vermont, who would like to know, is there anything you can see of an eclipse far away from Argentina or Chile, perhaps even as far as Burlington? <laughs> um, well, it, it, it turns out that if you're outside of that umbral path, then you'll see a partial eclipse. You'll be seeing a partial eclipse. But it turns out in the continental United States, uh, we are too far outside of the path. And so there's not even a partial eclipse visible uh, from the United States. And I think that's true even in the, uh, you know, from Key West or the, the, the furthest Southern tip or, or Hawaii. Hawaii is not on the right side of the earth uh, to see this as well. So I don't, so um, I think the virtual watching is the place to be. Um, but hopefully it stimulates your interest in looking at the sun and looking up at the sky. And so, and that's always available to you. So keep looking up is my best advice. 
Mm -hmm. um, going back to eye safety for a moment, Larry Krakauer from the class of 63 asks, are these thin plastic glasses really safe? Do you not need special, you know, welders, filters, et cetera? Amanda, you want to try that, take one? that one? Yeah, I can take that one. So uh, you do need to be careful that your, um, that your glasses come from a reputable source and, um, and that they are free from defects. So one of the things that we do when we, when we um, are looking at the sun in, in our classes at MIT is what you can do is hold the filter up to the sun, but you know, obviously not looking directly at the sun and ma make sure that there are no pinholes that are coming through. Um, the filter, and so if you if you hold it up in the general direction of the sun, you know, so that the that the fil that the filter is blocking the sun. If you see any pinholes of light, don't use them because that those pinholes will let the sun in, will let the sunlight in, the UV um, energy in, and will can damage your can damage your vision. But you don't need the heavy, thick welder's glass. And in fact, it's not suggested that you do use um, welder's um, glasses to, to, view the, um, to view the eclipse because they have different strengths and um, you wanna be, you wanna definitely be very safe. Uh, Mike, let's bring in one more question and then I'll continue to give a little more advice about what we will see or what you wanna look for in our video feed coming up. So Mike, let's have another question. Um, we have some questions about timing. There are a couple of questions. One, can you speak about the um, Saros cycles and what they are? And also just the general solar cycle. Yeah. So uh, let me do the solar cycle first. The solar cycle uh, is a 11 year cycle of the activity of the sun. And, um, and so it goes, it, it, the best way to uh, think about the solar cycle is how many sunspots are apparent on the disk of the sun. And uh, we just had solar minimum. And so uh, just in the last year with solar minimum. So the sun is coming out of its minimum phase. We're starting to see more and more sunspots on the disk of the sun. You may see one uh, that the moon is covering or has covered. And um, uh, and so we're just going to see the uh, increase in the number of sunspots over the next five years or so. Um, and that also means there's an increase in solar flare activity, which can give rise to beautiful displays of the aurora on the Earth. Uh, with regard to the Cero cycle, the Cero cycle is, uh, I think it's an 11-year uh, period where um, the, uh, the direction of where the Earth moon and sun align over the surface of the earth um, uh, repeats. And so it would be that you see a very similar uh, eclipse circumstance separated by, I think it's 11.8 years. And, um, and uh, so these, these eclipses come in cycles. And these were uh, well recognized by the Greeks and maybe even um, more ancient astronomers, these eclipse cycles. Um, 18, the only thing I can add there is 18 years, 18 years right? instead of, 18. yeah, 11. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the 18 years. Thank you. Yep. I didn't. All right. So let me tell you, as we are uh, just under um, 20 minutes, we are about 26 minutes away from the total solar eclipse uh, from our video feed. And um, I just wanted to say, you know, what to watch for uh, in the coming minutes as we get just over the top of the hour. Um, and what you're seeing, of course, is that the crescent of the sun is becoming narrower and narrower. And now is getting to be the really interesting time where if you were on the ground, you'd notice these uh, crescent shapes in the, in the shadows of leaves, or if you deliberately created a, a shadow pattern with a, your own pinhole camera or a colander, you'd be able to clearly see this uh, crescent shape on the ground. The lighting is really changing dramatically and it's getting colder. Uh, so this is what's happening right now. As we get to uh, as we get to 11:07 this morning, uh, we will see that the the uh, disk of the moon completely covers the disk of the sun, and that's going to last for two minutes and ten seconds. And um, and then everything uh, after the uh, after that those two minutes of 10, 10 seconds of totality uh, happen. 
and everything goes in reverse and the, the sun reappears and the crescent gets fatter and fatter uh, as we go to about 1240 Eastern time was when the, the eclipse will end for anyone um, uh, in uh, Chile or Argentina. Um, I want to focus in on what it is. What's, what are the amazing things that happen during this time of totality? Um, and that's really, this is the main event. This is, this is, uh, this is where all the action is in this uh, two minutes and 10 cents. 10 seconds of totality. Um, and this is uh, just a plot of the, uh, the brightness, just a little uh, light meter placed on the ground. And this is a logarithmic scale. And you can see this incredible, you know, quantitatively here in this plot, there's the deep level of darkness and the sharpness at which, if you're an observer on the ground, that you are plunged uh, into darkness and uh, why it's such an amazing physical, uh, and it's an amazing physical and visual experience, uh, which is why once people uh, experience uh, for themselves a total solar eclipse, you find them chasing them all over, all over the world. All right, so here are the things to look for. Again, this is gonna be right around 11.07 this morning. Uh, and if that time changes because we switched our telescope location, we'll, we'll let you know. But seconds before totality, think about how that, that crescent is getting to its narrowest, narrowest part. And in the last seconds before the moon is going to finally uh, cover up the sun, Remember that the, the moon is full of mountains and craters. And so the bumps from the mountains and craters along the edge of the moon give you this am amazing shadow pattern uh, or a light pattern that, uh, that look like speckles or bright spots along the edge of the moon. And these are called Bailey's beads after an astronomer who first described them uh, a couple of centuries ago. And then finally, that last mountain or valley or pod on the moon that's still letting the disk of the sun come through um, is just this overwhelmingly last bright speck of the disk of the disk of the sun. And the eclipse is starting to happen everywhere. You're starting to see the, the on the left here, you see the outer layers of the sun starting to appear, but you still have that bright shiny part on the right. And this is called the diamond ring effect. And these things last literally seconds. It seems so fleeting and so beautiful. And then finally the moon wins and the moon finally succeeds in totally covering up the disk of the sun. And that's when the brightness drops by a factor of a million. And, you're, and because the bright sun has gone away, the outer layers of the sun become visible and it's almost like they just pop into view. And you see this amazing structure of, of the sun called the solar corona. And this is what Mike was uh, explaining. We don't understand why is it so hot and so extensive? What drives the heating of the solar corona? And so, uh, so scientifically it's a mystery. And from a visual point of view, it's absolutely stunning, an absolutely stunning thing to see. Uh, and then uh, as we're looking at the total solar eclipse, you want to um, look carefully around the rim of the moon. You might see this orange red uh, structure called the chromosphere. And it's gonna and look for pieces of the chromosphere that are becoming detached and flying off. And these are uh, called prominences. Uh, again, two minutes, two minutes and 10 seconds later, which, it, which on the ground I assure you is just four seconds. It just feels like four seconds. The diamond ring comes back on the other side. And then Bailey's beads come back on the other side because the moon is moving, uh, in this case, from left to right across the disk uh, of the sun. And, uh, and, it, and everything then happens uh, in reverse. So I uh, take groups all around the world. I'm very lucky to get to take groups all around the world to see total solar eclipses. And many people bring fabulous extensive equipment because they, they want to get the picture of the eclipse and, 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 and so forth. And, and I always say that's great, but no matter what you do, no matter what your goal is when you go on the total solar eclipse, take time to just look. And that's always my best advice about a total solar eclipse is just be there, be in the moment and just look. All right, so with that, um, let's see what other questions we have. And I, uh, I think we'll just go to questions. We were thinking to take a break, but uh, we're, uh, 
we're uh, getting to under 10 minutes from now, and I think maybe we'll just go to go to some questions. Mike? Okay. Um, several people are asking, can you see things like Mercury and Venus and stars during totality? Oh, yes. I can take this one. Yes, yeah. Amanda. <laughs> Absolutely, because for two minutes, it, be it becomes not quite as dark as the middle of the night, but it becomes quite dark. And so at this point, you'll be able to see stars pop into view. Um, whatever happens to be in the, in the region of the, um, you know, of the sun at that time, you'll be able to see um, as well. And so it, it is as, it, as, as if it were sort of a, you know, early evening, a kind of a twilight time. Okay. Um, one final question here. You just spoke about two minutes. Gina would like to know, does totality always last the same amount of time or does it depend where you are? Uh, I can Both. take that. Yeah, oh, um, I think, um, I think, well, Amanda, I think the maximum is about seven minutes. Is that right? Seven and a half. So uh, it depends on, uh, again, many different factors. Um, it depends if the moon is at the, you know, it's absolute closest point to the, to the earth then the moon is even bigger. You know, it's apparent size is even, even bigger. So it means it takes longer for it to totally go across the disk of the sun. And then it's, um, you know, is the moon exactly overhead at the time of total solar eclipse and so forth. So this, as eclipses go, this one's uh, on the shorter side at uh, two minutes and 10 seconds. Um, and does anyone remember when is the next sort of six minute eclipse? Uh, and, or what the duration is in April 8th, 2024. Um, the 2024 one certainly has some places of three and three and a half minutes because okay, that's what yeah. we're looking at. Okay, so I think it's uh, even even longer. All right, so we are, if, if we're looking in Argentina, uh, are we seven minutes away? Let's see. I believe we're seven minutes away. Mm -hmm. From the totality, that feed looks a little different than that. The Punta Argentina, let me go over and check that. So it looks like we're about seven minutes away. Um, and anyway, at this point, just right now at 11 o'clock uh, Eastern time, the uh, shadow of the moon, the umbral shadow of the moon has touched down on the coast of Chile, has touched down on the coast of Chile. So observers uh, in Chile, uh, if they have clear skies, um, they will see this. And if, if you're in an eclipse, if you are at a location looking, <laughs> wanting to see a total solar eclipse, um, but the clouds have different plans for you. Uh, you are nonetheless cast into darkness. And so you experience eclipse darkness, uh, even if you um, don't have the good fortune to see the amazing outer structures of the sun. So about six minutes away now. And uh, as we get to the last couple of minutes, we're gonna go quiet and uh, just see what we see on the screen. So Mike, let's take in another question. Um, earlier, Rick, you mentioned the diamond ring effect and Bailey's beads. Are these things you look at with the naked eye and is that safe? Oh, um, it's right on the edge <laughs> of uh, whether you look at them with your uh, glasses on or off. Uh, and so there's a fine point as to when you can take your glasses off. To be perfectly safe, you wait until it's, uh, the sun is completely blocked. Uh, and you would uh, see those, uh, you would see the, the Bailey's beads and the, and the diamond ring with the glasses on. Uh, Amanda, do you have a different experience? No, that's what I would do as well. Um, you want to, you always want to protect your eyesight. And, and just to be honest, they, the Bailey's beads and the diamond ring are still spectacular through eclipse glasses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I'm just going to mention quickly that, uh, uh, again, we're using a uh, video feed from slow.com, S-L-O-O-H, which is a uh, astronomy educational organization. And, uh, and they themselves are switching our feed from different locations. And so uh, that's why we don't know exactly which feed we're going to see at which moment in time. And uh, so um, we think we're four minutes away uh, based on a, a video feed from Argentina. 
but yeah, bear with us. Bear with us if we're uh, if we're not quite on time with our timing here. I think that's why the sun the, the sun sometimes meet, looks like it's more covered and less covered because it we're switching feeds from different places from Chile. So in, in any case, the umbral shadow has reached the coast of Chile, and so there are observers. Uh, if they have clear skies in Chile, who could right now be seeing the totally eclipsed sun. And for a telescope feed in Argentina, we are about four minutes away. Um, if I, I'm gonna bring up a slide just to remind people again of what to look for. And uh, give me a moment here. And there's my slide coming back. All right, so just a reminder of what to look for as we get uh, close in time. So the last slivers of the sun uh, being covered by the moon will have the effect of these bumps on the edge, the rough edge of the moon, giving us the phenomena of Bailey's beads. And then the last bright spot from the sun is the diamond ring effect. And this happens really fast, really fast in those last few moments. And then we have about two minutes and 10 seconds of totality. And there you want to be looking, looking around the edges of the sun and looking outward from the, uh, the edges of the moon, looking around the edges of the moon, the outer layers of the sun, and just see what structure you see. Uh, and visually, and depending on the camera and the exposure of the video feed, uh, we may be able to see differences in the structure of the uh, solar corona there. And uh, again, two minutes and 10 seconds later, which is like four, four seconds <laughs> as it feels on the ground. Uh, the diamond ring comes back and we're back to, uh, back to Bailey's beads. I will point out that it's, we may not, we don't have control over the camera. So it, it may take a while for them to adjust the exposure time and, and such to get it to this point where we can see the coronal image, the coronal okay. details. All right, so with that, uh, we're going to just uh, sit here quietly uh, with you and as uh, as we are able to discern uh, what it is we're seeing in our in our video in our video feed, uh, we will bring that to you. We will give you some very brief commentary there. But uh, we'd like to sit back and quietly enjoy this together. standing by for the video feed from whatever telescope can can bring us a clear image. And we're uh, trying to regain our feed. Uh, this could be a phenomenon of uh, the bandwidth that's coming to us from Argentina and Chile as the world tries to tune in in the last moments. So stand by, we'll bring in uh, the feed as best we can. The, as we speak, the umbral shadow of the moon has passed over the border of Chile into Argentina. So the total eclipse of the sun is now visible in Argentina. So we are standing by to see if we can regain our video feed. Welcome to live television. Uh, I don't know what feed is on your screen, but it uh, looks like we have a feed of darkness. Uh, at one of our sites and it could either be eclipse darkness or, or there in the eclipse clouds. 
So for about the next uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, the eclipse umbral shadow is now making its way across the country of Argentina. And depending on where we're able to pick up a telescope feed, we'll pick up the eclipse in progress. So stand by, bear with us. Uh, we may be back now to look, oh, uh, there we have a feed, there we have a feed. Uh, and that is uh, actually the eclipse, that live feed that you're seeing the eclipse is, I believe is, uh, I can't tell if it's, if the image is switched around the telescope, whether it's it just ended or not. So stand by, we may be getting, it looks like it's a post eclipse. There's no feed there, but I think that Based on the orientation of the sun, I think that feed may be just post eclipse. Let's watch carefully to see if the crescent of the sun is dropping. If we're looking at La Punta, Argentina, this is more to the west, I'm sorry, more to the east in Argentina. And so uh, we may uh, just be a few minutes away from a total solar eclipse in the eastern, I'm sorry, in the, yes, in the easternmost parts of Argentina. Uh, in which case uh, the totality is at about 11, 12, or in about two to three minutes from now. Again, it just depends exactly where we are on the surface of the Earth. And our feeds are coming from many different locations. So bear with this as we try to decode them. Uh, but the feed I'm seeing on my screen uh, looks like an increasing crescent of the sun. So that would be post eclipse from that location. Yes, it does look like it's getting bigger. Yeah. Oh, all the drama. So again, thank you for bearing with us as we're trying to decode the feeds that we can get. We're just gonna stay in this quiet mode until we, until we know that the, uh, the umbral shadow of the moon has Is headed off back across the uh, back across into the uh, South Atlantic. So again, the umbral shadow of the moon is has crossed Chile. It is currently crossing Argentina, and uh, the umbral shadow in, will remain in Argentina for another ten minutes. And it's just a question of whether we have a telescope under clear skies in the region of the umbral shadow. And all I say is welcome to the life of an astronomer. Can you imagine all of the planning, uh, years of planning and logistics that go into uh, developing and designing a telescope system like my person showed you, that's capable of being transported halfway around the world and you successfully import the equipment into the country of your, cho of your choice, often, often with a lot of diplomatic, uh, uh, diplomatic uh, entanglement. And uh, then you're sitting there, you get it all working and ready and uh, the clouds have other plans. Speaking of diplomatic entanglements, there's actually a story of um an attempt to, to witness the, um, the 1914 eclipse um, in Crimea to, to do the um, general relativity experiment um, by a group. And um, the, the leader of the group, um, uh, Freundlich, turned out, it was, this happened during World War I and he was arrested as a spy and, and during the actual observation as well. Yeah. 
and again, they, it is still, uh, the, there are still regions of Argentina that are under total solar eclipse uh, for another uh, seven minutes or so. And so we're going to stand by to see if that. Now, the feed there that I'm seeing there uh, is rather promising. That would, if it's, uh, well, it looks like it's a replay if it's from Chile, but um, you can see the very thin crescent of the sun getting close to the edge of Bailey's bead. So 13, 13. Oh, that's probably in Argentina. I don't recognize the location. And again, sometimes the telescope you know, the optics can invert it, and so it's difficult. But let's see if we get to sense whether the crescent is increasing or decreasing there. Okay. And it's uh, the timing there is just a little bit behind our, our, our current clock time here. So again, there's some uh, another complication to doing to broadcasting a virtual eclipse is the time lag of the video feed. And so to those who uh, are on the chat, we are going from different video feeds uh, and re reacting to them. And uh, just depending exactly where that telescope is, you'll see a slightly different phase. Things just happen a slightly different time as, as the shadow of the moon goes across from Chile to Argentina. And so um, it takes all of about half an hour to cross a continent. The uh, shadow of the moon is moving at 25,000 kilometers per hour, or that's about 1,500 miles per hour, uh, mostly southeast. Uh, and the, that velocity corresponds to Mach 2. And so it's a very dynamic event. The timing is very dynamic, very dependent on exactly where you are on the surface of the earth. Uh, and uh, apparently for the feed we have, it's uh, looking like a five minute countdown. So this feed must be on the, um, the east coast of Argentina, which is the last part of the landmass to see the uh, totality. So it looks like they may have clear skies there just just in time. So again, what we're looking for is to see that crescent of the sun get narrower and narrower as the moon increasingly covers the disk of the sun. We're going to look for uh, the bumps on the edge of the moon, the irregularities on the edge of the moon to give us a really strange thread of light just before totality. That last bright speck is something we call the diamond ring. Let's see if we see the diamond ring effect. And then we'll have about two minutes, two minutes and about two minutes and five seconds at that location where we'll be able to see, the camera permitting, the outer regions of the sun, the solar corona. Mike, Amanda, any other tips? I just remember this time when, um, during my last eclipse that I saw in person in 2019, just this, this was the, there was so much anticipation and excitement. And I can just imagine being on the ground in Argentina right now, just watching this myself. I wish I were, uh, but I'm glad I'm seeing this feed right now. But yeah, it's, it's getting closer. 
Amanda, you talked about strange behaviors of animals. And I assure you that the human animal behavior is very strange at this point. Uh, the, it, the, you now know it's really weird. Uh, the, this, the disk of the sun, the normal sunlight of a normal day is totally disrupted. Uh, and you can see that the, the sun is being eaten. That it really, you really can get the sense that the sun is being eaten and it's going away. And, um, and if you didn't know better, you'd worry about whether the sun was ever coming back. Right. And, uh, exactly. and, uh, and so again, the, with the, the thin light of the sun, the, the shadows are incredibly sharp, uh, is getting cold. Uh, I get goosebumps, uh, not only from being cold, but just from being just how strange it is. And that's as a veteran of seven total solar eclipses. Uh, and, um, uh, and I don't know if I if I see seventy, um, which probably I don't have the lifespan to do, um, but I think it would be the same. All right, so we're seeing one of the feeds <laughs> from somewhere. Oh, that is oh, that's a diamond that. ring. Diamond ring. We're seeing a diamond ring. And oh, look, the diamond ring is disappearing, and the corona, the the outer edge of the sun, is coming into view. So that was probably uh, Western Argentina. There it is in Western Argentina. There's the corona. You can see they're dealing with clouds. Right. You can still see it through the clouds, which yeah. is wonderful. As long as and, the clouds aren't too thick. Yeah. And so you might, um, you might uh, see that the corona is sort of extends more right to left than it is at the top. And that's the poles. The sun has a magnetic field. And we're looking at the poles of the sun, the magnetic poles of the sun at the top and bottom of the sun's image. And so the magnetic field of the sun extends further away, east and west, which is one of the science clues that the corona and the heating of the corona is partly driven by the magnetic properties of the sun. And so we are about a minute into totality here at this location. About another minute in that video feed of total solar eclipse, if the clouds will will let us let us see more. The details of the coronal structure differ from event to event, really just telling us how dynamic the sun is. Looks like I, we're getting more clouds there, so it's we're losing some signal, but I think I see a prominence up there around ten o'clock. Mm -hmm. A little red, a little red glow right around ten o'clock. So that's one of these uh, prominences, uh, and it's the red is from glowing hydrogen. It's the heated, highly heated hydrogen that's glowing. Oh, it looks like they're trying to adjust their exposure time to get more signal through the. All right, clouds. we're gonna we're gonna see the diamond ring coming back. Diamond ring, there's Bailey's beads. There we go. Oh. Diamond ring. And they just switch the filter. They just switch the filter. So now you just see that okay. little tiny edge of the sun that last time. Oh, how fantastic. Yep. All right. Well, we got a feed. Though. We got a feed that works. And thanks for bearing with us. We didn't know what feed we were going to get at what location. And so our uh, understanding of the timing of the event uh, it was going to be a little challenged. Uh, Mike, what did you see? I, I really like the way you can tell the difference between different solar eclipses because the corona is shaped differently each time. Like if you look at a picture of a previous solar eclipse, you can t if, you've, if it's one you've seen before, you can say, oh, that was the 2017 eclipse or that was the 2019 eclipse. So each one is different. It's much better when you look at them in person because your eye has a much larger dynamic range as a camera than most of our electronic CCD cameras do. So you can actually see much more detail in person than you can over a feed such as this. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, Are so we get, we're now- Go ahead, go ahead. Amanda, I'll, I'll just interrupt. Uh, go ahead. Uh, Amanda, I was gonna say, Amanda, what did you see? But then Mike, I wanna see if we're getting any comments or uh, things coming in over the chat. So Amanda, go ahead and then we'll uh, hear from our, our viewers here. 
Oh yeah, no, I was just um, noting here that the crescent that we're seeing is growing. It's, it appears to be growing in, you know, in extent because we are seeing as the moon is moving off, it's exposing more and more of the sun. And, and so as you, the last moments before, you know, it goes into eclipse and those first moments after it comes out, it just is this tiny little crescent, which sort of grows over time. And I love seeing that. It's just really spectacular. And at this point in time on the ground, I am just exhausted <laughs> because you have so much adrenaline and maybe it's because I'm always leading groups and, um, and they think it's depending on me for it to be clear. <laughs> and so I always have this vision of the, of the bonfire being built, uh, ready for the astronomer in case the clouds uh, take the eclipse away from us. So, uh, so my adrenaline, adrenal adrenaline level drops uh, and I just feel exhausted <laughs> and uh, almost the same here that we were uh, successful that we our uh, production crew uh, thank you Clayton uh, and abroad I believe who uh, are working behind the scenes in MIT video production who were able to find a feed for us All right uh, Mike what uh, what reactions are we getting over the chat oh I think people were a little worried for a while that we weren't going to have a feed, <laughs> but at the last moment it came in through, came through for us. Um, several people have asked, will the prominences and corona be bigger and more active in 2024 as we get away from the solar minimum? Yes, absolutely. As Amanda was, or maybe Michael was, was just saying, you were just saying, Mike, uh, every eclipse is different. It just depends on where you are in the solar cycle. And even at any given time in the solar cycle, the sun can have very, very highly varying uh, activity. Um, and there are NASA programs that we monitor the sun and the NASA program is called Living with the Star. Uh, you know, so the, the sun is this uh, amazing uh, thing that basically controls our lives and our energy. Um, and so we really care about the sun and how the sun works and uh, what the activity levels of the sun are as it goes through its sunspot cycle. So uh, so every eclipse is different, and uh, the 2024 eclipse will be closer to solar maximum. So uh, what might happen is you might see the corona extending even further out. And it's a little hard in a video feed because you don't know exactly the exposure camera settings of the video feed. Um, but with your naked eye, uh, you, you know, sometimes you can see the corona extending out several diameters of the moon. It's really quite, really quite spectacular. Mike, what else? There we see a, a replay there. I don't know if you have the, the there, but we're getting the, the replay. Yeah. Um, back to the fifth grade classroom. How can you actually calculate when these things will happen down to the second? And oh, Mike, you, yeah, I'll only let you take that one, Mike. Um, actually, we spend a lot of time measuring the location of the sun and the moons and the stars with respect to the earth. So by this point, having done it for so many years, we have excellent knowledge of where the moon will be at any particular second, um, very precisely. For more distant bodies out in the farther solar system, it's more difficult to predict where they will be down to kilometers. But the sun earth moon system has been so well studied over the centuries and is so well known that we can predict these things down to a second centuries out. There's even, uh, yeah, go ahead, Amanda, please. Well, I was going to say that even um, in 1700s, in the 1700s, when Edmund Halley predicted the 1715 solar eclipse, um, that one, he was only off by four minutes. And um, that was with much cruder observations than we have now. And so we know where everything is much better. Yeah, and uh, the Greeks uh, could do this, even the Mayans, um, and maybe even the Inca could predict solar eclipses. And in fact, there's even a machine, like, it's a very complicated watch basically, but a, a com complicated clock called the Antikythera machine, which was probably designed by Archimedes uh, that was found in a shipwreck, or a shipwreck uh, at a place called Antikythera. And uh, it's really quite, uh, quite uh, spectacular. All right, so we're we're getting close to the end of our uh, our broadcast at eleven thirty Eastern time. We might go over just a few minutes uh, with a few more questions and comments as they come in. Mike, what do we what do we got? Um, some people have asked. A lot of people list themselves as anonymous in the questions, but we've talked a lot about the sun. Is there anything we can learn about the moon from solar eclipses? 
Oh, do you want to try that, Amanda? I think I can say something. Well, I, I think that, sure, I can. Um, the, the thing that we learn about the moon really is um, the detail of the, the mountain ranges on the edge of the moon as we're seeing it at the time of the eclipse. And that's what leads to, as Rick was saying, the, the Bailey's beads effects. And so what that tells us is, you know, at the time of this of this event, um, you know, this is, it, you know, this is the mountain range, this is the edge of the moon that we're seeing so that we have a mountain range. And so it can tell us, you know, that we have higher peaks and then lower peaks and then, um, you know, or, or uh, passes through those peaks. So we can really get some of that topography of the moons, um, of one portion of the moon's um, moon surface it really depends on the orientation of the moon at the time of the eclipse. And I think, um, it's also exactly where the edges of the totality occur. Um, also tell you uh, with some precision about the orbit, the orbital position of the moon uh, as well. And, um, and that's uh, less of a factor now with the uh, laser reflectors on the moon left by the Apollo experiments uh, that um, precisely nails down the position of the moon. But I think, I think that historically they were also important for refining the exact orbit of the moon. Mike, let's take one or two more questions and then we'll wrap up. Okay. Sally Johnston asks, um, since everything is rising in the east, why does the eclipse shadow seem to be traveling west to east? Oh, um, I'll take that one. It's the motion of the moon. It's the, the, the moon moves from west to, uh, west to east. And so, so just like you'll uh, see uh, uh, tomorrow night or in two nights, uh, from now, you'll see a crescent moon in the evening sky. And then the next night, the moon will have moved, moved a little further away, uh, a little further west uh, in the sky, a little further from the, uh, well, we'll have, moved, we'll have moved east, a little further away from the western horizon. But uh, th what that makes happen with the shadow, it makes the shadow move from west to east as the move, moon moves eastward in the sky. So anyway, bottom line is driven by the motion of the moon. Mm -hmm. Um, can you say a little bit about the evolution of the moon's orbit you talked about earlier? Will solar eclipses become worse as time goes on? Amanda, you want to try that? I'm sorry, the, my feed just uh, crackled for a second there. So <laughs> <laughs> something about the evolution of the moon's orbit. Is that what, it was, what the question you was? You mentioned Mike? earlier that the moon, moon is slowly receding from the Earth. And right. um, John would like to know, does that mean the solar eclipses will get worse as time goes on? Okay, sure. So what is happening is, um, as, as you know, the, the moon raises um, water tides on the earth and the earth is actually raising tides on the moon as well. And so this is just, this is a slight distortion of the, of the shape of the moon as it orbits around the earth. And so what happens then is um, be, this, this little bump raised on the moon is actually pulled back towards the earth. And so what it, what's happening in the end is that we're transferring angular momentum. And so the moon's um, orbit is slowly spiraling out away from the earth. And that will continue happening until they get into this into this um, orientation where um, one face of the Earth is always facing one face of the Moon, and so half of the Earth will always see the Moon, and half of the Earth will never see the Moon, and this is a um, totally tidally locked. At that point, the Moon will be further away from the Earth than it is currently, and so we will not get the same kinds of total solar eclipses as we have now. We can get annular annular eclipses. And I just want to say with regard to the crescent moon, about three nights from now, um, look for the crescent moon and near the crescent moon, you'll see two bright stars, which aren't stars, they're, they're Jupiter and Saturn, uh, which over the coming week are, will be as about as close as they have been in at least 20 years. And on December 21st, it's as close together in the sky as they've been in about 800 years. Uh, anyway, it's just a fun thing to watch. So, you know, you can always go up and you, uh, go out and look up at the night sky. And I do that. I gain, gain inspiration in, in a year where we need a lot of inspiration during 2020. <laughs> All right, Mike, is Absolutely. our last question we, we might take in? Um, we talked about other moons. How do eclipses appear on other planets? I'm a member of the class of 77. Okay. Um, Excellent. Yeah, Amanda, why don't you take that? Certainly. So um, uh, you can actually see um, 
uh, uh, from one of the Mars landers, you could, uh, they have some pictures of, uh, of an eclipse of the sun by, I believe it was Phobos, Mars, one of Mars's moons, Phobos. And um, it looks like um, uh, it, Phobos is not as large, does not appear as large as the sun. And so it only covers up a portion of the sun as seen from the surface of Mars. So that, those are the types of eclipses you can get. You might see a portion of the sun disappearing um, if the moon is, appears to be smaller than the sun. And then, um, or you might get as on the um, giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, you might get moons completely covering the sun being much larger than the sun. Um, and so just completely blocking all view of the, um, of that Corona that you, we do get to see from the earth. All yeah. right. Okay. Well, with that, we're going to wrap up our broadcast. Uh, I want to just say thank you again to uh, uh, MIT Alumni Travel, the MIT uh, Alumni Association, uh, MIT Video Productions, uh, Clayton uh, in the truck. Uh, a particular thank you to uh, Melissa Chapman Gresh, who has helped organize us. And, uh, and Amanda, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Rick. This was this was really spectacular, and I'm so glad to be a part of it. And for, for the last words, I'm going to say before I pass it to Mike to close us out is uh, is to say thank you uh, for joining us. You know, we may be grounded, but our curiosity is not grounded, and uh, so I'm really thrilled um, that uh, you found a way to uh, keep your curiosity and your passion for learning and your connection to MIT uh, uh, flourishing even in a challenging year. So uh, thank you for not letting your curiosity gra be grounded and never letting your curiosity be grounded. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Mike. Thank you all, Mike. All right, thanks, Rick. Um, indeed, I'd like to thank all of our participants today. Thank everyone who attended for your enthusiastic participation and um, for being patient with us, especially as we tried to navigate the varying feeds. Thanks again to Dr. Amanda Bosch and Professor Rick Binzel for sharing their knowledge and experience with us this morning. A survey about this webcast will be sent out later today, and we hope that those of you who have registered will get a chance to share your feedback with us. We're grateful you could be with us and our best wishes to you all. I'm Dr. Michael Person saying farewell from Planet MIT.